Congress returns from a two-week recess on Tuesday to a fresh round of chaos. House Speaker Mike Johnson is looking to pass an aid package for Ukraine while avoiding Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's attempts to strip him of the gavel. Congressman Dan Kildee is back with us. You almost would feel bad for him, Congressman, if he had not brought this upon himself. Yeah, it's hard to feel bad for him when he really fails to do the job of the Speaker. He's the Speaker of the whole House. He ought to measure the sentiments of the whole House and then bring policies forward that the whole House can support. Because he's pandering to the most extreme members of the Congress, just like Kevin McCarthy did, he's placed himself in this position. If he wants to avoid Marjorie Taylor Greene's antics, he can make a phone call. The easiest person in Congress to talk to is Hakeem Jeffries. And if they had a conversation, there may be a way for us to find a path forward. I know they talk, but if they had a if, if Mike Johnson was interested in having a substantive conversation, Hakeem is one of my closest friends. I know, just based on how well I know him, he'd be open to that. So uh, this is an important point, then. So you're saying that, um, just to put a finer point on it, the, to your knowledge, Speaker Johnson has not reached out to the Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries. So all of this conversation about, will Democrats save Johnson? What will they do if, if a motion to vacate moves? He... Speaker Johnson's not currently trying to negotiate with the Democrats. Well, I don't know that they've had a specific conversation mm -hmm. on that point. I know they talk policy mm -hmm. all the time. But we, you know, we made it clear when Kevin McCarthy was facing this question that if he wants to have a conversation about a path forward that would include Democrats, we're open to that discussion. Kevin McCarthy said, go jump in the lake. Now, I don't know what Mike Johnson's position is, but I know he's getting awfully close to the edge of that lake right now. And if he wants to continue to be speaker, and he knows and realizes that the functional majority of the House of Representatives is comprised of Democrats and Republicans, then he can have that conversation with Hakeem Jeffries. We can find a path forward. We can do the work of the American people. And then we'll litigate who's going to lead the Congress in the next session at the November ballot box. Well, that, that's the, the rub. Um, because if I'm, I'm Speaker Mike Johnson, at a certain point, I have to do math. I just have to do math. And the math tells me I'm not in this job come next January. Yeah. That's what the math, and then the Senate's a different conversation, but the House, the math is saying I'm not in this job. So then it becomes a question of do I play to the math or do I play to Marjorie Taylor Greene? Because either way, What's at stake is my legacy in the job. Yeah. And so if, if he wants to burnish a legacy other than he was Marjorie Taylor Greene's pet and, and he was bullied into taking uh, basically illiberal behavior and, and positions on policy like, I don't know, the border. You also now have the question of Ukraine, and I think this is the particular point. I'd love to get your view on how that is sort of shaping his approach to that lake that you re that you referenced and whether or not he's just going to do like McCarthy and jump in it and swim on out, you know, to someplace, the <laughs> yeah, swim out to the pasture, right. uh, or is he going to try to stay on shore and, and actually serve out this, his speakership knowing that I'm in the job because I got Democrats who are going to hold me here at least till January. I think the thing he faces is what every speaker faces. There are consequences to that calculation that he's trying to make. If he thinks he wants to make it to the end of the year, maybe try to hold the House, he has to you know, figure into that calculation the fact that if we don't act on Ukraine, for example, mm -hmm. there's a consequence for the for the entire world. Uh, the Ukrainian people are just hanging right. on. They don't have the material they need in order to defend against Putin. And there, we don't have a lot of time for him to sort of sit and ruminate. He can't sort of run the clock up right. until yeah. November. Right. There's a lot that's going to happen between now and then. A lot of people compare Congress to high school. They don't believe in science, you know. They failed civics, but and now I'm they're sure not going to math class. Now they're failing math. Now they're failing math. They skip at school. You know, they skip at school. They, I guess they do well at lunch. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. Alicia, it's like high school. Yeah. Congress is like high school. It's like high school, except as we can all appreciate, the stakes are extraordinarily high. Very high. This, the, this, Very this, high. Which you know, I, t with respect to all my high schoolers out there, because I do understand that the stakes are high when you are in high school. But you know. We're talking about matters of national security. We're
we're talking mm -hmm. about matters of domestic productivity. And instead of focusing congressmen on those core issues, they are instead in la la land. And it's, it's one thing to say, you know, he doesn't have control over his caucus. That would be fine if it had no real consequences for the American people. It has consequences for America no as question. a superpower. Mm -hmm. It has consequences for human life right now. There are people who will die because the speaker is unwilling to just walk across the aisle and say, let's take the will of 300 plus members of the House and 70 members of the Senate and the pen of the president to support the Ukrainian people in their struggle against Putin's you know, unprecedented uh, invasion. There's a human consequence to this in the short term. In the long term, there's a geopolitical consequence that could be felt for generations. And we all run for these jobs because we want to do big things. They seem to be so focused on their own internal political theater that they've forgotten the reason that they came to this place in the, in the first place. Congressman Dan Kildee of Michigan. As Welcome back to the weekend. Need another reminder that the 2024 presidential race is anything but normal? Look no further than Donald Trump's social media, tie, media tirade this weekend. Judges overseeing his legal cases and asking, how many corrupt judges do I have to endure before somebody steps in? Somebody steps in? We, we all know what happens when Donald Trump asks folks to stand back and stand by a deadly insurrection. In fact, Trump is choosing to make January 6th a centerpiece of his campaign and defending the rioters by calling them political hostages. Joining us now to discuss it all is Tom Jocelyn, a principal author of the January 6th Committee's final report, and NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Tom, I, I want to start with you, uh, and I'd like to play out of the gate uh, sound from a conversation we had yesterday uh, with former Capitol Hill uh, police officer Harry Dunn. Could you take a listen just real quick? Sure. No pushback against it equals a win for them. That's why we have to continue to speaking out and pushing out, pushing it back and calling out for what it is. BS. Like, that's what it is. And you need people that are continually pushing that. As long as the, the counter narrative is out there, you have to have people that are out there to continue to be truth tellers about what happened that day. To Simone's point, the, the counter narrative is, is being pushed consistently, constantly by Donald Trump. Uh, Harry Dunn's running for Congress as a former police officer on Capitol Hill, who was there on January 6th, drawing that line. The work that you did on January 6th, you obviously saw and heard a lot of detail about where those lines should be drawn. How do we, as, as Americans, step more fully into the narrative that Harry laid out, pushing back, calling out the BS, and making sure people understand that what Donald Trump is actually doing is subtly asking for his supporters to get engaged. And we, as Simone pointed out, know how that turned out on January 6th. Yeah, you know, I, Simone said it right at the outset that this is so far from normal. And that's exactly a thought that occurs to me every day studying this. Mm. Um, when you look at the January 6th defendants whom uh, Trump refers to as uh, hostages and political prisoners, this, this rhetoric is so far outside the bounds of our normal politics that we have to address it as such, right? He doesn't see himself as a political candidate vying for the presidency who wants to run the U.S. government. He sees himself as an insurgent who wants to overthrow the U.S. government. And that's what a lot of his people believe, too. When you look at the crowd being held in D.C., for example, a lot of them have anti-government extremist beliefs. They don't believe that the U.S. government is legitimate. They do not believe that the U.S. government uh, really is a sovereign entity that should be respected. And Trump is directly playing into that by calling these people hostages, a word that's usually used in armed conflict between two sides, right? He's, he's, he's completely uh, outside the bounds of our political normalcy. And here's the thing that we all know well, Michael Beschloss, which is it's not just Donald Trump. It is also elected officials, people with True. real power who are carrying his water. I want you to take a listen to something Speaker Mike Johnson had to say this past week on Newsmax. I made a commitment uh, immediately after I got the gavel that we would start releasing that. Originally, we were trying to blur some of the faces to protect the innocent, you know, people who were just there and just happened to be walking through the building. To protect the innocent, you know, people who were there and just happened to be walking through the building, Michael Brushes, my question to you is what happens to a society where you have a large swath of people who believe a lie about that place's own history? 
Well, you know, the place that starts, Alicia, is that there's a tradition in this country and actually a requirement that goes way back. When an aspiring new citizen came to this country, they would be asked a question by a federal official. And what was the question? The question was, do you advocate the overthrow of the government of the United States by force or violence? That was a threshold demand just to become a citizen. Now we've got the Speaker of the House saying that this was okay. President of the United States saying, or ex-president and aspiring next president, saying uh, that what happened on January 6th was something to be praised, that these are hostages, these are prisoners. We are living in a world that is upside down. And unfortunately, there is now a large media sphere that will let, get left them go get away with this lie. And if they do, our society does not have too much future because the most elemental thing that all of us as citizens have the right to depend on is that our government protects us against the threat of a group going into right. the Capitol, attacking the Congress, and possibly, as some tried that day, killing leaders of Congress, including the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and other officials. We should note that, well, I, Alicia, to your point, that you, I mean, the, the, the tours were closed that day. Tours were closed during the time of uh, the, on January 6th because of COVID. So there were no random people walking through the building. And Mike Johnson was one of the chief cheerleaders of the insurrection of Donald Trump's big lie and spoke to him regularly. Like... Right. Uh. I was interrupting you, Simone, because Tom really wanted to jump in after he heard that sound from Speaker Johnson. Go ahead, Tom. Well, you know, look, I've looked at a lot of the January 6th security footage, right? The, the committee looked at a lot of it. Release it, Speaker Johnson. Release all of it, right? It's not going to validate your conspiracy theories. It's not going to validate what the hard right wants to believe. In fact, I would be glad to walk people through what that security footage actually shows, which are that far right extremists led the attack at every uh, point they could on that day. And a lot of the people who walked through the Capitol were not there, obviously, uh, peacefully. A lot of people who were there who had been charged were quite violent. And in fact, a lot of the uh, defendants through Donald Trump praises his hostages and political prisoners and advocates for their cause have been charged with attacking cops, right? This is not mm -hmm. some peaceful tourist visit, as Speaker Johnson would have you believe. You know, not only then is this not normal, this is also very, very, very dangerous. Yes. And um, a, a judge, a court filing from a U.S. district judge, Roy, Royce Lambert, and this was filed on Wednesday, and this is just, this does not happen. Violence, it says violence risks begetting a vicious cycle that could threaten, cherish conventions and imperil our very institutions of government. And that sense, political violence rots republics. This cannot become normal. We as a community, we as a society, we as a country cannot condone the normalization of the January 6th Capitol riot. Judge Lambert was a Reagan appointee. Um, he served as a judge in um, D.C. January 6th trial. Just Michael Beschloss, the, the words, the fact that he has to write this. People can have been attempted to be harmed by Donald Trump's rhetoric. People have died mm -hmm. because of what he has called on people to do. There are not two sides to this. No, there aren't. And the other thing is that we're not just debating what happened four years ago, mm -hmm. as important as that was. There's going to be election this November. And if Donald Trump loses, or maybe if he wins, what this kind of rhetoric does is to say to people, if he loses after the election yes. day, go into the streets, mm -hmm. you know, go after your governors, protest to state legislatures. Mm -hmm. And then when the ballots are counted in early January of 2025 in Congress, if we get that, that mm -hmm. far, may God help us to do that. Uh, January 6th was great. Why don't we do it again, but this time succeed? Look at the number of people around Trump who have said the problem with January 6th was not that this attack was tried, that this effort to overthrow the ballots, but that it didn't succeed. Next time, they say they have to do better. Mm. Tom, as is so often the case, Michael Beschloss got to my point before I did, which is when <laughs> Don, Donald Trump is saying this, it's Ch not just... Channeling Alicia. <laughs> I'm channeling you, Michael Beschloss. Mm -hmm. He's not just, like, trying new talking points. He's trying to create a permission structure, right? He's trying to both sort of carry the lie through about what happened on January 6th and in the lead-up to January 6th, but he's also trying to create a future permission structure so that it can happen again. I mean, that's exactly right. He's already created a permission structure in which the U.S. government is illegitimate in the eyes of most of his followers, many of his followers anyway. Just think about that, right? This isn't a, a guy who's running 
for the president to run the U.S. government. This is a guy who's running on a platform that says the U.S. government is illegitimate and mm -hmm. implicitly deserves to be overthrown. Right? A lot of these people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th believe that. They believe that the government was illegitimate, that the election was stolen. They believe Trump's lies. And these lies are corrosive to the very foundation of our democracy. So do me a favor, though. Connect that to me with Trump saying he'll be a dictator on day one. Well, I mean, just the fact that he's willing to go that far and say he'd be a dictator on day one, who's going to trust him on day two, right? I mean, this is completely abnormal in the history of our politics, right? The dictator word used to be out of bounds, used to be off limits. We used to understand that America was founded on overthrowing a dictatorship and saying that we're not going to, uh, you know, abide by the rulings of some distant monarch, right? This is what January 6th is really all about. His followers believed that they were fighting for the new 1776, the, seven, the second American Revolution. It's completely the opposite. They were on the side of the new King George. And the new King, mm -hmm. the new King George is out there portraying himself as this freedom fighter when it's, again, exactly the opposite. He wants to take away the freedoms of the American people. He wants a rule of one, not a rule of dem uh, by democracy. So, so, Michael, I want to pick up on Tom's point because it, I, I think it's a very important one and a very powerful one True. to make because um, I hear what my friend is saying, but out here in the streets of America, we were just talking with the Secretary of Labor right? 51% of the American people think Donald Trump did a better job than the current mm -hmm. president on the economy, the Middle East, Afghan. I'll just go through the list of stuff. So what is it, where is their historical nexus that we can look to to see how people process information like this? I mean, it's just as stark as this is, um, to the point that they actually will elect a person who's telling them, I'm going to be a dictator. And they're like, OK, let's do that. Well, look what's happened in the last 30 years. You know, people feel that we can just spend endlessly trillions of dollars and borrow them and it's never going to have an effect. Or in 2004, as you both remember, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people told pollsters at the time that George W. Bush was running against John Kerry that they thought Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11. When Barack Obama was president, the number of people who told pollsters, we think he's a secret Muslim, which right. great if he was, but he wasn't. So the point is that in the, the society that we're living in, a big lie can get around the world in a way that it probably could not before an Internet gave some crazy person uh, access to billions of followers. Mm -hmm. And that also goes for certain cable channels. And the other thing that I'm worried about is this, is that one of the most Dangerous things I've heard in the last few weeks was, do you remember when Donald Trump said, I don't need the Nikki Haley voters? Mm -hmm. Yes. What that says to me is that in his mind, and I'm just speculating here, maybe he's already dealing with a situation in his brain where, you know, it's not necessary to win the most electoral votes in November, mm -hmm. uh, as one member of the Trump entourage is quoted as having said uh, before January 6th. Let's go straight to the violence. Mm -hmm. That quote from him, not from the office. Our institutions are only as strong as the people who support them, lead who them. lead them. Yeah. Our democracy is only as strong as the, the people who are willing to fight for its preservation. And I... Tom, I'm, 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 I am so concerned. I know there's, we have all these conversations about how Democrats can't scare people to the polls. I am, I am scared. Let me help you out. <laughs> I am scared. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't think that the threat that Trump poses is really being taken seriously enough by some people. You know, I think that there are a lot of people who have their heads in the sand. You know, uh, Liz Cheney, who I've worked for and known for 20 years, recently said that she warned that we may be sleepwalking into a dictatorship. I think there are a lot of people who are sleepwalking. They're not paying attention that, you know, when it comes to the debate about whether or not Trump is an autocrat or not, this is silly. Of course, he's an autocrat. He, he literally puts the auto in autocrat. It's about one guy, you know, and his own vice president uh, was out of bounds because he wouldn't shred the Constitution for him on January 6th. So that should be we've had all the warning signs we need. Right. It's just time for people to wake up and understand this is not a normal, as you would say, Simone, this is not a normal political candidate fighting for the presidency. This is somebody who's trying to overthrow our government and our institutions. Welcome back. Democrats suddenly have a sunnier outlook about their 2024 prospects in Florida after a pair of rulings from the state Supreme Court this week. The court allowed Florida's six-week abortion ban to take effect. 
in 30 days. But the court will also allow voters to have the final say on the matter in November with a, with a proposed ballot amendment that would enshrine abortion protections in the state's constitution. With us now is Democrat Fentress Driscoll. She is the minority leader in the Florida House of Representatives. And Minnie Timaraju is here with us in Washington, D.C., president of Reproductive Freedom for All. Welcome to you both. Welcome to you both. Uh, Minnie, this was, this was quite a week in, in Florida. Um, and how, how do you assess the, the, I guess, the conversation around abortion IVF now in light of what we see the courts having done in Florida? Because um, I think a lot of people, quite honestly, just put it on the table would have thought, oh, it's Florida and it's, you know, it's, this issue is not going to get on the ballot. Voters won't have a say here. The court said, no, this is an issue should be a part of the conversation. But you still have the before times where you have this 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 limit, the six week uh, limit. Yeah, so it how, was sort of you... a schizophrenic decision right, by exactly. the court. On yeah. one hand, they were like, we're going to let the six week ban go through, which is a reminder is before most people know they're pregnant. Yep. So it's extreme. It's basically a total abortion ban. But we're going to kind of split the difference here and make sure the people get to vote. But what I will say is this, taking a step back, abortion rights activists in the state of Florida have been working on this initiative for over a year. Mm -hmm. And before anyone at the national level believed that Florida was winnable, they believed it mm -hmm. because they were paying close attention to the other states where independents and Republicans were crossing over to support abortion rights. They mm -hmm. knew that DeSantis overplayed his hand. They knew the legislature was extreme um, and they believed that this could happen. So kudos to them first. But yes, now it does seem to make Florida more in play mm -hmm. because the six week abortion ban is so extreme and the groundwork has been done. Um, I think something like 15 percent of the signatures to qualify for that ballot initiative came from Republicans. Mm -hmm. Twenty five percent of them came from non affiliated voters. Mm -hmm. so that work is important. Quick, quick follow up on that. Uh, will the organizers uh, have a say in how the language on the ballot is set? Or is that something that's going to be done by the court? Because that matters in terms of yes. how voters process yes or no yes. on the question. I believe the court has a lot to do with it. And um, the decision indicates that. But I'd love to hear from our, our friend in the state who <laughs> might know a little more about the details. Yeah, yeah Minority Leader Driscoll, I mean, uh, please pick up where, where Michael Steele and Minnie left off. What is what what is the language that will be on the ballot? And my second question is, what do you what do you make of the national conversation now spotlighting Florida? Um, Minnie's point about how local leaders have been at the forefront of this. Um, and I, the subtext I read from that is that they should continue to be at the forefront of this. <laughs> so what say you? Yes, so the language has been set. That's what the court's ruling on Monday was about. And it's very simple language. It asks voters whether or not there should be limited government interference in these very personal medical decisions that are of the heart in the home. And so that's why I think we saw the crossover with the signing of the petitions. And so many Republicans and independents were willing to sign these petitions because it's not really a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. It's a human issue. It's a health care issue. And the organizers have been able to frame it as such, which makes matters. And then to your second point or your second question, Simone, about what do I make of the national conversation? I will tell you that uh, I think they're right. I think Florida is in play now. Just the, sim the simple fact that this language is on the ballot is not enough to drive turnout. I want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it gives us an opportunity to talk to voters clearly about issues that matter to them. In January, we had a special election here in Central Florida, and I was able to lead a team with the Florida House Democrats to flip a seat from red to blue in a special election. It's the first time that was done since 2018 in conjunction with the party and the donor alliance and the coalition groups. It was amazing. But the way we won that race was talking about abortion. It immediately disqualified the Republican candidate, but qualified our candidate because there's a clear distinction between who wants to protect your freedom and who wants to take it away. And we were able to win 70 percent of independent voters in that election by talking to them about the issues that matter to them, which are affordability. Florida's having an affordability crisis and abortion. Uh, uh, Minnie, I want to play for you uh, some sound uh, from President Trump uh, on uh, abortion is a reporter asked him a question and let's let's take a listen to his response
What should we prepare for? Could that be a change in position? No, not a change in position. It's going to be uh, something that uh, is very important. You, know, you have to go with your heart. You have to go with your spirit. And it's going to be something that I don't think people would be overly surprised. But we also have to remember we have to win elections. It's very important. You have to win elections. Otherwise, you go back to where you were. Okay, so can we just say that that was a word salad of absolute nothing? You have to win a lot. You have. I'll get to that point. What? It's going to be something that is very important. You know, you have to go with your heart. Well, Donald Trump, where is your heart on abortion? Um, that's that's the question I would have uh, as a follow up. And then you you end it. He ends it, many with. You have to win elections, otherwise you go back to where you were. Mm. So you have to win elections tells me, are you lying now or are you going to lie later mm. about your position on abortion? Mm. How, how do uh, those who are advocating for reproductive health for women transfix the, the language of Trump so voters really understand what this man is telling them? I mean, he's basically going to lie to voters about what Republicans are going to do on this issue. Right. Because it's going to come and say, oh, no, we're going to, you know, we're not going to impose a national ban. We're going to do 16 weeks. Well, he knows that's not what his base wants. Mm -hmm. So how, how do the advocates help force that reconciliation between Trump and his base at yeah. the same time making it very clear? This man's going to lie to you about what he's going to do or not do on abortion. Issues. So the most effective thing that can be done, and I give a lot of credit to the Biden-Harris campaign for doing this, we saw ads that just rolled out, is play back his words. Mm -hmm. The most effective message is the one from Donald Trump's mouth where he brags about overturning Roe, takes a lot of gleeful credit for it, and the clip where he talks about punishing patients and doctors. Mm -hmm. Those are the two most effective messages with the electorate. And we assume, as advocates, that everybody knows this, but a lot of folks yeah. haven't dialed in yet. Right. So just hammering home Donald Trump, in his own words, is critical strategy number one. But number two, and this is our job as advocates, is to help credential the president and the vice president and to say, here are all the things the Biden-Harris administration have done, because that gets lost. So, for example, we have a Supreme Court oral argument in a couple of weeks that's about defending the Biden administration's effort to use regulations for emergency health care to protect women in states with bans. That is a big deal. We got to talk more about it and make sure folks understand it's not just Donald Trump is dangerous and a liar and he bragged about overturning Roe and will do it again through non-congressional means, but that Joe Biden supports you, mm -hmm. Kamala Harris supports you, and they're your best line of not just defense, but going back to codifying a federal right in Roe. Yeah. You know, I, uh, it's super important that we're talking about all the efforts to protect access to abortion, but as you both know well, Minnie and Congresswoman Driscoll, Driscoll Republicans are going after Mifepristone, right. IVF, your ability to have a family, your ability to decide if you want to have kids. Do you both think that the pro-choice, pro-abortion, pro-reproductive rights movement is keeping up with those who are anti-family planning, anti-all these things? I think about how Republicans took over state legislatures over the course of 10 years and had this very deliberate strategy that Democrats missed and, yeah. and still suffer from. Yeah. Do you think that your folks nationally on the ground are matching what Republicans are doing in terms of how much they're focused on all of these different things? Yeah, I mean, I will say that the reproductive freedom movement, pro-choice movement, you know, pro-abortion access movement has been raising the alarm about this takeover of legislatures, yeah. um, pushing Democrats to take firmer positions on abortion access for decades. I think we saw a sea change in 20, 2016 when the party platform actually changed to support money, many of these positions like eliminating the Hyde Amendment, limitations on federal funding for access to abortion. But it's been a long time coming. What I will say is the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, the you mm -hmm. know Democratic Governors Association, they're meeting right now, Democratic AGs have all taken really firm positions yeah. and really led the way in the states. And it's very, very important partnership for us now. And it's been critical in shifting this yeah. fight. And to your point, why governors mm -hmm. matter so much. That's right. Yeah.
Minority Leader Driscoll, we're going to give you the last word on this. I mean, you are in a place, remember, what, remember the last elections in Florida, folks? People wrote Florida off. They said Florida is unwinnable. Uh, but Democrats in the state like yourself and Nikki Freed, the state party chair, have kept at it. And you talked about the gains and flipping a, 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 a seat in the state legislature, not to mention flipping the seat in the mayor of Jacksonville. What is your message to folks going into as they, you know, we look forward to the summer and then the general election, the fall in, the, in November? My message simply is that Florida is winnable. We've been building up momentum to this proof of concept, starting with that mayoral race and then the special election. And now having this ballot language uh, in November is essential. It shows us that Democrats have a pathway to talk to the voters about what they want to talk about, which we know is essential to turn out. You know, and, and I also say, I mean, look, Florida has, what, 29 electoral votes? We need Florida. Saving our state actually helps to save our country because we need a state as large as Florida to be able to flip blue and to help secure American democracy. I feel like this is no longer just about, you know, making sure Democrats win. It is protecting our democracy. It is essential. And so I know that I'll be doing all I can on the ground in coalition with the state party and our donors and, and everyone to make sure that we make a strong showing for the Biden-Harris uh, campaign and make sure that we're protecting every Floridian's freedom to be healthy, prosperous and safe. We begin the weekend with breaking news. Just moments ago, the Biden-Harris campaign released its March fundraising numbers. And folks, the campaign says that it raised an eye-popping $90 million last month. That brings their total cash on hand to, wait for it, $192 million. That is the highest total amassed by any Democratic candidate in history at this point in an election cycle. To compare, the Trump campaign said this week it raised $65 million in March, with $93 million in cash on hand. Biden campaign finance chair Rufus Gifford joins us now exclusively for a conversation. Rufus, it is good to, to see you, my friend. I'm going to cede the ground to Michael Steele yeah, because yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't hear. <laughs> Rufus, it's good. It's good to see you, brother. Um, so, hey, congratulations, man. That's that's some killer numbers uh, coming out of the oh, campaign this morning. You, you guys got to be feeling really good about that. We are. We are, Michael Simone. Great to be with you guys this morning. It's, uh, it's been a, we, we are, we are fired up by these numbers. I will say, um, when, when I started this job six months ago, when we're looking to just build and build and build, engage our donors, engage our supporters, uh, frankly, we're even surprising ourselves to a certain extent about what we're able to put forward here. And what we're excited about, when you look at these numbers, $90 million a month in March, $187 million in Q1, um, and this $100 million cash on hand advantage over Trump and the Republicans, this speaks to the strength, uh, this speaks to the strengths that we really do have right now, and uh, it's exciting to see. Uh, Rufus, it's Alexi McCammon filling in for Alicia Menendez this morning. Good to see you, and thanks Hi, for being Alexi. with us. Great uh, that's certainly an impressive haul, and I know that the president and Democrats themselves like to say that it's uh, reflective of party unity and enthusiasm from Democrats, but we also know that you guys need to get some of those Republican donors, too. So how much are you communicating with Republican donors about joining in on this effort, and how much do they contribute to the haul you've raised so far? So I would say this, if you look at the advantage that we do have, so um, the money that we've been raising in March, and I think since the State of the Union, you've seen a whole bunch of things, uh, Alexi. You've seen the president barnstorm all the swing states, all the battleground states. You've seen us invest $30 million in reaching out to voters black voters, Latino voters, AAPI voters, and to your point, also Republican donors. I can tell you I am personally on the phone with Haley supporters every single day. In many ways, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We've got a lot of work to do. Obviously, our opponent, the other side, has told them that they do not have a home on their campaign. Well, we look straight into the eye of Republicans and Haley donors and say you do have a home here. Look, we might not agree on every issue. That's going to be clear. That may... And and that may continue to be the case. But we, we are going to make the case um, that, uh, that Joe Biden, to reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, um, is the right step forward. And, and frankly, we've gotten a lot of folks coming over to our side.
You know, Rufus, today the Axios has this headline that says the Trump Trump's $50 million gala set to double Biden's triple president fundraiser. They're saying that uh, this fundraiser that Donald Trump is having is set to eclipse the $26 million that was raised by, this is NBC News reporting now, raised by President Biden last week at his star-studded Radio City Music Hall. Um, what, what say you about the Trump campaign's uh, claims about these numbers? And, and are you, uh, you know, are you concerned or not concerned? I mean, the guy is literally in court all the time. He owes a lot of money to a lot of different places. I have to imagine this is a, a, a better place for you to be than the last time uh, around this time during the campaign in 2020, where the cash was not as flowing. Well, yeah, a, a few things on that, Simone. First of all, uh, on his fundraiser, look, uh, Trump and his orbit has a loose relationship with the truth, to say the least. I look forward to seeing their FEC report when they're forced to file in nine days to, or, uh, or so to make sure that, uh, that those numbers are what they are. But this is, this is the ultimate point here. Um, every single dime that you give to the Biden-Harris re-election campaign, we spend talking to voters. We have, and since the state, in just in the last month or so, we have a hundred offices open in the swing states now. We are, we are, of course, engaging, whether it's ad buys, whether it's phone calls. We've made hundreds of thousands of calls to voters. What is he doing? Um, he, he may put up some, some money tonight with his uh, hedge fund billionaire f f friends and a closed-door fundraiser in Palm Beach. I, we understand that. But we would never trade our campaign, our strategy here, just comparing the, the, the last Thursday's event in New York, over 5,000 people, sold-out venue and the most iconic venue in the United States, uh, people giving everything from $25 up to a lot more than that. That is the kind of grassroots enthusiasm that is fueling us. And again, we are not spending money on legal bills. We are not hawking gold sneakers um, or any of that stuff. The money that we are, we are raising, we are going straight to talking to voters. This election is going to be close. Every single person knows that this election is going to be close. Um, and it will continue to be close until Election Day. We're going to leave no stone unturned, um, and we're going to continue to invest the money uh, that we are privileged to have you invest in us, and we're going to go out into the swing states and, and, and win this thing. So, Rufus, I'm picking up on that swing state point because as a former chairman uh, at, at every level of, of, of politics, the one thing you, you translate money into are donors. I mean, so you take an event like um, Trump is having tonight, you know, he's got donors who are going to do a max of $814,000, one donor writing a check for $814,000. Um, your numbers uh, over this haul that you've uh, had in, in the first quarter uh, talk a little bit about what, how that translates into support, individual support, 1.1 million donors making over 1.9 million contributions uh, to the Biden campaign. That's a very different kind of, uh, you know, how should we say, engagement uh, by donor voters out there uh, than we may see coming from the Trump side. That, that's right, sir. And no one knows this as well as you, Michael. I, the truth is, so we've doubled. I mean, think about this. We have doubled our email list just in Q1 alone. These are new folks, folks who haven't, didn't even invest in us in, uh, in 2020, which was a historic campaign in a, number of, uh, in a number of areas as well. So you look at those people, 97% of our donations are $200 or less. Why does that matter? It means that we can continue to go back to those people um, and, and have them continue to fund this operation from now until Election Day. The more people we can bring into this tent, the more people we can engage at every level of this operation, the better. And that's what we're building here. And that's what we're excited about. I think, you know, we didn't anticipate having this enormous cash, cash, cash advantage um, at the end of March. Um, but I can tell you this, we are going to take it and um, again, we're going to put that right back out into the states. We're going to be talking to voters every single day between now and November 4th. Rufus, before we let you go, I, I would note for the folks who are watching that you are, you've had a lot, of, a lot of titles, a lot of jobs. You are the former chief protocol officer of the United States. And I could imagine that in having conversations with donors, that experience is very helpful. Uh, what are the donor class saying about Israel and what is happening in the Gaza Strip and even Ukraine and Russia? 
Well, listen, yes, as, as you say, Simone, I've had the enormous privilege to be able to travel the world uh, with President Biden uh, uh, in, my, in my prior job. And I can tell you this, that there is no one who has a better grasp of global issues of world affairs uh, than President Joe Biden. I can tell you, um, having been in those rooms uh, behind closed doors, there's no one who, who has the same level of respect uh, on the world stage than Joe Biden does. Um, there are enormous challenges facing the country. There are enormous fa challenges facing the world. And um, I can tell you this, that as an American, I, I am absolutely thrilled that we have uh, Joe Biden, uh, President Joe Biden at the helm.